I noticed that you had a habit of asking vendors what I would call pesky questions. <laughs> and so you have that mind of pushing vendors a little bit on what they're doing and why. And there's so much to make sense of. So I thought I'd sit you down and find out like the method behind your methodology. Oh, that assumes there is some, but yeah. uh, I'm happy to try to elucidate as much as I can. I really want to talk about uh, your pilot license though, uh, but I don't think listeners want to have like an aviation podcast, but I think it's pretty Next cool. Time. You're going to be able to fly to <laughs> events yourself. That's pretty awesome. Keep your fingers crossed. The weather hasn't cooperated so far. That's going to be really, really cool. So uh, you and I are sort of similar in that we don't have like a narrow focus coverage area like a lot of our colleagues in the analyst world do, where they might focus on like a specific area within manufacturing or procurement, or they go to the same shows, like you go to a bunch of different shows. So how do you connect the dots between all the different types of events you go to and the things you look into? Well, I f will say first that um, being a professional dilettante, one of the things that brought me back to the analyst world, I love it. I can't help it. Um, to your question, it really only works if you can make sense of all these various things that, that you're working on. So for me, although I have a very broad coverage area, I like to think it's unified by a real sense of purpose and intent. So my focus area, if you can call it that, is all things customer experience. And the reason I come to that is because through firsthand experience and also observing the market in a lot of companies in a lot of different industry sectors, what I see is that we really have some very big challenges as businesses in actually creating customer experiences that feel like they're consistent and frankly mutually beneficial for us as customers and also us as businesses. Mm. Um, so that is the unifying thread for me. And that really cuts across a wide range of stuff as you implied in your question. I'm looking mm. at marketing, I'm looking at sales, I'm looking at customer service, I'm, I'm looking at how companies are even thinking about the ways they pull together all these different parts of their operations and the ways and uh, the, the different modes, if you will, in which they interact with customers. Yeah, that reminds me of an article I was reading by Eric Kim Kimberling of Third Stage recently talking about this whole slew of digital transformation failures because my underlying focus area tends to be transformation in general and the obstacles to it and all the sort of sorting through the technology hype around it. And he pointed out that so many of these failures have a couple things in common. One of them is a lack of external focus on the customer. So these, these projects that just really were never focused on, laser focused on a better result for your customers, right? So I thought that was really interesting to see how many products had derailed because of that one mishap. It's not hard to do, right? I yeah. mean, you get so caught up in your own sense of what's important as a business that you lose track of whether your customers, number one, think it's important, uh, number two, whether they know about it, and more importantly, whether you've actually got any customers for it at all. Mm. So how do you get to the bottom of this with vendors? Because I feel like when we go to the shows, even though they do make a real effort to inform us in, in good faith, like they do need to be pressed on certain issues to really give uh, your readers, your clients, a real genuine understanding of what they're up to. So how do you formulate these questions and how do you push them? I don't know that there's any real science behind it. It's, it's really literally the stuff that's top of mind for me when I'm listening mm -hmm. to what they're saying. But I think the, the perspective that I'm coming from is what, what are the ways in which whatever the vendor in front of me is talking about is actually helping enterprise customers to do a better job of understanding their customers, communicating, uh, interacting, and engaging with them effectively and making sense of that in a way that is going to help those organizations to continue to build effective businesses over time. And, and that's really about uh, recognizing that uh, this is a question of not just selling effectively to customers. This is about really knowing and understanding your customers and what's important and valuable and compelling to them so mm -hmm. that over time you're developing new products and offerings that continue to be beneficial and relevant to those customers and possibly new and different ones as well. Which brings me to a recent blog post you wrote called 10 signs you have a customer understanding deficit and three things to do about it. So you didn't leave people totally hanging. Um, but so it's a uh, face the truth. You listed 10, 10 symptoms. What, what inspired that? Uh, 
firsthand experience. I have mm-hmm. seen almost all of these at close range. Um, I have seen them in a number of different organizations that I've either worked in or, or had the privilege of working with. And I can tell you that no matter what line a vendor is selling you about how great their technology is and what it can do for you, these underlying obstacles and challenges still exist in many, many organizations. And, and I would consider them, frankly, pretty commonplace. Yeah, and there's some kind of scary ones on, in my view because they, they sound in a way so basic. Like, like, for example, salespeople don't log opportunities and customer input consistently. How can we move ahead with when that's not happening? That's a big one. And it's funny because, uh, you know, as you know, John, if you talk to anybody in the circuit that we frequent, um, you know, the CRM market's been around for 20 years. And for 20 years, this has been a big issue. And quite honestly, it's still an issue for a lot of companies. How do we move beyond that? Well, I think there are a number of different approaches here. Um, one is clearly the sort of carrot and stick combination of actually encouraging and requiring salespeople to use these systems. The reality is they never love it. And so there's, mm-hmm. there's really no sort of um, self-reinforcing way of getting them to do that. However, Wait, so even my super beautiful UX isn't going to lure them into <laughs> doing it? Your super beautiful UX is probably getting cluttered with ever more fields that you expect a salesperson to fill out as well. So almost by definition, uh, no. Um, having said that, where, where I do see a really significant glimmer is in a lot of the um, digital assistants that are coming out, some of them from the vendors that have built CRM systems, some of them through their ecosystem partners. And to me, what is most fascinating about that is it's basically creating a new kind of interface that's much more uh, intuitive and is much more closely designed to support the way salespeople actually work in the real world. And it's not only making it easier for individual salespeople to get the information they need from the system, and to figure out what the next best best action is to prioritize their own activity um, and, and um, behaviors. But it also then makes it far easier for salespeople to put information that's really important back into the system. And that ultimately is what gives us the data, the basic inputs that right. really allow us to be more effective, to do things like more accurately predict what, um, what deals are going to close and when, uh, and ultimately, to help salespeople be more effective. Yeah, and without that data, you're just you're you're at a full stop there. Absolutely. So that's a huge one. Um, another one that I thought was really powerful that I think relates to this show as well is uh, vanity metrics abound, but meaningful impact is unmeasured. Tell us about that. Um, I'm sure you've observed this, but one of the things I see and one of the things I consistently hear is, for example. Um, whether or not it's using AI, uh, looking at performance metrics, quote unquote, of marketing campaigns that are really only looking at things like uh, delivery, click-throughs, opens, um, Mm. you know, quote unquote, engagement scores. And there's never any discussion, or at least there is very rarely any discussion of how those things connect to the metrics that ultimately matter most to a business, like revenue, like deals that have closed, like deal size, like customer lifetime value. I mean, define any metric that really gives you a better sense of the overall health of your business. Why aren't marketing metrics connected to that? Instead, we're making up all kinds of scores because that's what we can measure in a marketing context. And frankly, there is very little effort, I would say, in general, to actually connect what marketing is doing to the really significant outcomes that matter to businesses. Yeah, and that's something that came up a lot yesterday for me. Uh, I was talking, I'm going to butcher the last name a little bit, but I was talking to Mark Abramowitz, uh, who works in the service cloud area at Salesforce. And he was talk, he made a very interesting point about how with the growth of the service cloud, because the service cloud's been doing really, really well for Salesforce, uh, catching some of the other clouds and like the competition's heating up, I guess. But um, the... The point being, he said, it's we're now, this customer service is now in the growth business, not the cost business, which I thought was super interesting. And it led to a really good discussion about, like, because if you can really embrace that as a company, then your whole approach to customer service can finally change, right? Yep. Because, because now, instead of this happy talk around, like, well, let's do higher value stuff, like, now you have a real incentive to do it because you've tied your service to customer fulfillment and, and you know, post-go-live satisfaction or whatever it is that you're 
tracking. But one of his big points was that you need new metrics to reinforce all this, right? Because now you've, you have this new philosophy, woohoo, and you retrain people and you give them these new opportunities. But if you can't measure it, then you're going you're gonna to have like a point where you're not going to be able to keep that momentum. And so I asked him about that and he said, well, we're still trying to figure out what some of these new metrics are. But, you know, there's progress there, but it's, it's encouraging to me that at least we're talking about it because these vanity metrics from the web are so frustrating. Absolutely. Because I don't think they really tell us what's going on. I don't know? think they do either. And they're often viewed, the, the things we can measure may well have some significant meaning, but they only have meaning mm. when we analyze them in the right perspective, right? In the right context. And I think that's very often what's missing. So for example, how can you look at what's happening on engagement with marketing material from a service context and connect those two things, right? Mm. Um, how does that influence um, sales cycles, for example, uh, whether that's in a B2B context or in a B2C context? And you know, ultimately, a lot of this is really about having some connected sense, some shared understanding of customers across these different departments and mm also having a, a view to the metrics that might be coming out of different departments that influence each other. And if we aren't looking at all of these things in a more holistic way um, and understanding how specific areas influence the bigger picture, we're really mm. fundamentally missing a trick. Which kind of brings us to this show and, and, and pretty much every CX show we've been to this spring, but, but here as well, the emphasis on, on the so-called customer data platform, right? Which is vendors acknowledging, I mean, the so-called CDP, which is one of my least favorite acronyms, has been around for a while, but it's really picked up buzzword momentum this year, I think, as, as companies are acknowledging that, that if you have a good experience on one side and then you screw up the other, then you have nothing, really. And um, that came up in the State Farm interview on the, in the keynote yesterday where he said, you could have the number one mobile app in the world. But if you fall down in your contact center, then what do you really have? And so connecting the dots, right? Like how do you provide a platform where, where you can provide what you're saying, like, like, like some continuity between these different departments? Like how do you do that? I think you have to do it on several levels simultaneously. Um, and we tend in our sphere to talk a lot about technology. It's not just about the technology. Yeah. I actually think the starting point is defining as an organization what good looks like. What is it you're actually trying to achieve? What ideally does your customer experience in all of these different contexts and these different circumstances or situations? And how do you create something that is consistent across those different interactions? That has nothing to do with technology. That's mm -hmm. about being very clear in the intent and in the priorities and the goals and communicating that effectively consistently, and I've got to say frequently to everybody in the organization so that everyone is painfully well aware of what they're really trying to accomplish, no matter where they mm. sit in the organization. Um, then you can start to think about how you use technology to help reinforce that. But I fundamentally believe if the people in the business are clear on what it is they're trying to do, a lot of the challenges that we'll continue to have with making the technology work effectively will be much easier to overcome. Darn, I thought you were going to say that AI was going to solve this. <laughs> Man. Uh, it can help, but it's not going to, you know, if you're waiting for AI to solve your problems and customer experience, you're going to be waiting for a long time. I probably should have put AI in quotes in this context because we use it so liberally these days. Yep. Uh, yeah, I, I hear that. So, so in general, what do you think of this push towards sort of customer data platforms and this notion of focusing more on the integration. I mean, you look at it from a Salesforce perspective where they had acquired MuleSoft specifically with more of that acknowledgement in mind that that we can't have these cloud data silos if we're going to deliver. Is are, are we on the right track here? Or? I think we're getting there. Uh, and it's interesting because to me, the, the data issue is one where it's a lot easier to see what the future is going to be than how we're going to get there. And I think there are a number of technologies um, and it's everything from graph databases to yes, absolutely machine learning and artificial intelligence that will help us to improve the way we collect and manage and use customer data in a far more consistent way. The challenge is how we get there from here. And that is a big messy problem. Um, and my personal take is pragmatism is going to be the most effective approach here because 
for all of the talk about CDPs, the reality is you're never going to have one database, um, not in not in the near term, right. uh, in any case. So the question is really, what are the multiple strategies that you're going to use to create an end result that feels consistent and joined up for customers, whether or not your databases are absolutely um, totally integrated. Uh, mm. And I think that is probably in the near term to medium term, an illusory goal. Yeah, that's fair. So did you learn anything in the last couple of days that surprised you or make any discoveries? Or? Um, I would say I didn't really get any big surprises here. Mm. I think what we've seen, and I think it's important to acknowledge that is um, continued advancement from Salesforce on what it is trying to provide to its customers and what it's been talking about for some time now. Uh, and I think actually that consistency is important because these are difficult problems to tackle. They're difficult on a technological level. They're certainly difficult on an organizational level as well. So thinking that we're miraculously going to get there in you know, mm. six or 12 months is, uh, is probably a little pie in the sky. All right. So I'm going to ask you uh, something that bothers you and something that, that, it, that you find fascinating. So, so looking ahead, like what what kind of piques your excitement and interest as far as where this whole enterprise thing is going? Is there anything that you feel optimistic or excited about? I really do. I I think that interestingly, overall, the technology that we're using to interact with and understand and engage with customers is getting much much easier to use and much much easier to. Uh, make do what it is we ultimately want to do as businesses. And that fills me with a lot of confidence. Uh, it's interesting because the technology is actually getting more complex for the technologists, but it's getting a lot easier for the users. Mm. And I think that's a very important trend. Um, what that means is that we really have to focus on the stuff that arguably has always been the hard stuff. You know, and to your point about transformation, it's really about asking ourselves the hard questions about what we're trying to accomplish how we're going to get there and, and why that's what we're really trying to do over something else. Yeah. Which brings me back to my service cloud conversation because we were talking about that because it became so clear by the end of our conversation that the technology is now ahead of the average service customer service worker. And so like, I, I I'm still a little bit cynical because I still think a lot of companies are playing a cost play and customer service. And you can tell when you try to call them and you, getting these horrendous voicemail trees and they're des oh, yeah. they're desperately trying to route you to the web so they don't have to deal with you. Um, but, but, but let's just say that, that, that the Salesforce vision is correct and, and customer service reps are going to really be revenue producers in a sense. So they're, and, and so the question became, well, how do they do that? How do they transform? Right? Because you think of the average customer service person you've dealt with, they're not a revenue producer, you know, they're, they're cranky and underpaid. Well, you know. you know, this goes back to, again, the fundamental question of transformation. What are the roles that people have in your organization and what are the skills and capabilities and support that they need in mm. order to fulfill those roles? And mm. that is undoubtedly undergoing a pretty significant amount of change. Yeah, absolutely. And, and to Salesforce's credit, they, they're working on that. They have some really, really interesting programs, these trailblazer programs for service where they're trying to help teams and individuals think about that. Uh, because I do think that if you if you cling to roles of the past in a lot of these areas as an individual or as a team, you're in a lot of trouble. So, so vendors do have some responsibility to help with that transition instead of just talking up the absolutely the beautiful end game. Absolutely. <laughs> so okay. So what sets your BS detector off? We all have BS detectors. <laughs> what what when when vendors are talking like what what starts to make you kind of grouchy? I think what really really gets to me is when I see offerings or quote unquote solutions that in my mind are absolutely helping to perpetuate some really fundamental problems rather than helping companies do better. Um, and I look at things like, um, you know, questions around managing quote unquote marketing content, a term I use uh, because no one ever really stops to define what they mean by content. Um, and what I see is tools that are really designed to help feed the sausage machine for marketing rather than helping companies to stop and think about whether uh, the tactics and the campaigns and even their overall structure for mm. what they're trying to do with their marketing organization is effective or makes sense. 
And that's when your hand goes up in these sessions because I've seen it. That's when you start to raise your hand and say, hey. <laughs> I don't think I what's know how to on? ask anything that's not a hard question, Don. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I wish we were all wired like that. It would make these events a lot more a lot more interesting. Uh, well, well, thanks. It's been, been good to have you on. I, uh, I've had a whole series of, of male guests since my Raven cons uh, consulting interview. So it was about time that we had some Happy to hold gender to diversification <laughs> with some quality content. So, yeah, because other people are like, well, yeah, you're interviewing a lot of dudes. I'm like, sorry. It's just that I end up talking to Brian Summer a lot because Brian and I have a little bit of a podcast thing going. But Oh, Brian's a good guy. But glad to glad to break that up because, Brian, as much as we like you, we don't need to hear from you all the time. You can take a break. <laughs> I'm sure he's formulating a pesky question of his own as we speak. So, and by the way, for the listeners who made it to the end, um, we're testing out some new microphones that I have today. So I'm kind of psyched about that. Um, so... Um, for the last year, I had an ultra portable kit that was really great for like not having a lugs check bags and stuff like that, but it's not as good for sound. So I think this is going to be an upgrade in the sound style. So yeah, tell us how it yeah. is because then uh, I'll, buy, I'll buy some too. Though. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the test run. Appreciate that. And uh, we'll, until next time. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks, John. <laughs>